let me begin because we've got so much to talk about uh, by introducing Professor Joe Badaracco. So Joe, if you want it there, are you gonna, let's see, we have to bring you in. There you are. Hi, welcome. Here I am. Welcome, we're so glad you're here. Glad to um, be here, Deb. It's, it is a great pleasure to uh, have you join us. You know, um, Joe is the John Shad Professor of Business Ethics here at Harvard Business School, and he's a beloved professor uh, who teaches courses on business ethics, on strategy and management in both our MBA and our executive ed um, programs. He's a graduate of St. Louis University, also of Oxford University, where he was a Rhodes Scholar, and then of Harvard Business School where he earned um, both his MBA and uh, DBA. And he's had a wide number of administrative posts. In fact, Joe, I don't know if you remember, um, you were the head of the MBA program when I first started. And um, I interviewed you to learn about the MBA and how the library uh, could support the program, et cetera. So you were one of the first um, people that I met when I came here like, ooh, you know, 15-ish years, years ago. Anyway, Joe um, brings a, a wide range of administrative and board experience uh, to his research, which he's been focused recently uh, on reflection and how people who have incredible responsibilities and hard, hard decisions to make both professionally and personally, how they use reflection um, and juggle this uh, complex work situation when there never seems to be enough time in the day. Joe has an extensive uh, research and publication profile, and so I'm not going to go through all of that. You can look good. <laughs> uh, we, but we'll put the link in the chat to um, Joe's um, uh, research page, and that will get that can lead you right into uh, all of his publications and to Working Knowledge. Uh, which will have a number of uh, profiles of his, uh, his work. But I do want to read just a couple of the book titles that you've published recently, because I think we can see a progression in your work. Um, so one, defining moments when managers must choose between right and right. Leading quietly, an unorthodox guide to doing the right thing. Questions of character and the good struggle responsible leadership in an unforgiving world. So I think you can see um, where Professor Vadaracco's work uh, has been and is going. So we're just delighted to have you here to talk about your latest book, which is Step Back, How to Bring the Art of Reflection into Your Busy Life. So Joe, let's, let's dive in. Um, you begin the book by acknowledging how difficult it is to practice reflection, especially in this really fast paced environment where people feel they just don't have enough time to get everything done. Where the mantra is a focus on productivity and the Kaizen idea of strive, strive, strive and, and do, do, do. You underscore the importance of reflection. In fact, you start off by telling the story of a, a CEO who would double his employees' salaries <laughs> if he caught them sitting with their feet. I've got a window right here. So, um, caught them putting their uh, feet up on the windowsill and gazing out the window. And, you rec and what you recommend is a way to em embrace reflection is to think about it a little differently in what you call mosaic reflection. Can you tell us what do you, what do you mean by mosaic reflection? Sure, uh, just a bit of background about what led me to the mosaic approach. I think like most people, my view of reflection was something you do in solitude, in a tranquil setting mm -hmm. uh, for an extended period of time. You know, it's like going up to the mountain. And, um, my question that started me down this path was what do really busy people do, if anything? Maybe they don't reflect, mm -hmm. but if they do reflect, sort of when and how do they do it? And I was motivated to do this because like many of my colleagues, I often would recommend to students and others that they spend time reflecting without ever saying, uh, this is what it is, this is how you do it, and this is how you find time to do mm -hmm. it. So, I interviewed about 100 busy people, mostly managers, mostly in businesses, and asked them what they thought reflection was, when they did it, and so forth. And what I discovered was that they rarely did anything that looked like going up to the mountain. <laughs> what they did was find small bits of time here and there 
Mm -hmm. And each person had their own distinctive pattern of small bits of time. And so that's why I called it mosaic, because a mosaic is created out of little yeah. tiles or fragments. And that kind of describes the way busy people manage to do some reflecting. Yeah. So, well, you know, why don't we ask um, our participants that, you know, as you're sitting here thinking about this, are, what, what are some examples of those little bits of time that you take or when you may just have a moment to put your feet up on the, the windowsill. What does, what does that look like? You can um, use chat and um, just, if you put into all panelists and to everyone, then we can all see it. So go ahead and, and while we're talking away, um, put in things like, oh, here's Colette. She says she's at the gym and during commuting time. So that's a great idea when I'm walking my dog um daily walks when i'm oh there's another we've got a lot of dog walkers on this one so people are yeah go ahead and put in that was really that'll be fun for These us to good. come, come back to yeah yeah anyway so when you talk about the mosaic you also give us a framework um and you outline some design principles that i think are you know again a great way to to think about um how we might do this so the first thing you talk about is aim for the good and you know, at Harvard Business School, the bar is pretty high here um, for what a standard of good is. And, you know, so is this a form of, uh, are you thinking about the law of diminishing returns? Is this part of like, what what is good enough? And the other question I have, and maybe you can weave these two together is you talk about monkey minds and how busy our brains are. Uh, you talk about this whole uh, ecosystem of our minds and our brains that are hardwired to our nervous system. So can you talk yeah. to us a little bit about what, what, what do you mean by aim for the good? Sure. Let me start actually with the second part of what you mentioned, then I'll, I'll come to the okay. good enough approach. Uh, you know, the standard explanation of why people don't spend more time reflecting today is often involved uh, blaming the internet and smartphones. Oh. Right. And, you know, ubiquitous, seductive technology in some way. And that's true. Mm -hmm. But you can go back and read people who are writing 100, 200 years ago, and they claim they, they were concerned about being too busy and too distracted. So there are other reasons why people don't find time to reflect. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these. Some people feel they've got to be productive all the time. A lot of people have really serious responsibilities and they want to do them well. Uh, some people are kind of afraid to reflect because they're afraid where it might take them. Uh, and then there is what you refer to, Deb, which is how our minds work. And this idea that our, our minds are monkey minds actually goes back to the Buddhist tradition thousands of years ago that our brains just leap around. And that might have been because our ancient ancestors whose brains le le leaped around were more likely to survive because they were looking here for saber-toothed tigers and there for poisonous insects. So our brains just seem to work that way. So the approach to the, the first of these design principles that I recommend, the first of the four is just aim for good enough. Uh, there's an old saying, the, the better or the perfect is the enemy of the good. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you've got people who do, as you say, have high standards. And if there's something you feel you should do and you ought to do it really well, and you just aren't doing it that way, it's a good chance you're going to give up. So by good enough reflection, I mean you do it most days, you do it pretty well, you feel like you're making some progress, that's great. Don't feel it's got to be every day, certain period of time and you end the period with some great insight into your life or your work or something like that. Yeah. You know, just, you know, there's an old saying, you know, if a thing's worth do doing, it's worth doing well. There's some other things that I think are worth doing, even if you can't do them well or most of the time, but give it a shot. And I put reflection in that category. Right. You, you also talk about, you give us some real physical things to do, again, like connecting our body and our minds, and, and you you uh, talk about some of these overcoming the obstacles to reflecting things like you call it piggyback reflecting and sure. um, writing. That it's so. Tell us a little bit more sure. about how you found people were yeah. doing this. 
this is one of the things I discovered as I did the interviews and found out what people were actually doing. And that what I discovered is that there was often a physical component to the reflection. Uh, it was captured in the a comment by the, the venture capitalist you referred to who said when he was talking to the people who were, he, his firm had invested in, they were typically young people running startups, they were putting out fires all the time. And he talked about, he said, I'm gonna double your salary if I, said if I he put it in a way that sounded like a threat at first, he said, if I ever come into your office and find you with your feet up on the desk looking out the window, I'm gonna double your salary. And the point he was making is that it's really hard to do it, it's really worthwhile, but it's not just mental, it's physical. Put your feet up and look out the window. So I've, I noticed a number of the chat comments that yeah. went by, people talked about doing things physically, you know, running, being at the gym. Mm -hmm. That was true for some people, not everybody, but for some people it really worked. Few people would even sort of assign questions to themselves at the beginning of a run and then see where they were uh, at the end of the run. You know, there's a the long tradition of prayer in the Western tradition involves kneeling, basically. And in the Eastern tradition, you have uh, yoga and, med you know, lotus position and other meditative positions. We're not sort of disembodied spirits. You can't just flip a switch and go from thinking one type of thing to a more reflective thought. You often have to move your body, which is what your brain and nervous system are embedded in. And that probably in many cases, that means just getting away from your laptop because you see the laptop yeah. and we're like Pavlovian ro rodents and it's time to go to work. Yeah, yeah, it is. When um, we were talking earlier about um, Ashley Willen's book about um, Time Smart and a lot of her recommendations were just put down the phone, just move away from it. But this notion of physical, and I, I think you're right, the very first one in was I go to the gym, but it is this act of, of doing something different, not just being with totally within your brain. Exactly. It yeah. often, and I guess as I think back now in almost every case, there was kind of a physical accompaniment oh, okay. to the wide range of ways in which people reflected. Hmm. That's interesting. So then within this framework, you talk about three sections and actually the, the book is arranged that way basically as the, the introduction moves to the framework and then to these three additional principles. And I thought it would be, uh, be good to give people a grounding in, in what those sure. design principles are. So you, the first one you talk about is downshift. And I suppose there is a physicality to that too, because if I'm thinking about a car, you know, if I'm, I'm downshifting, it really <laughs> yeah. is a, a, right. a physical movement. And um, you you outline what you call mental meandering and celebrating were two of the two that piqued my, my curiosity. I'm a list making enthusiast. Like I'm a, one of these people, like many I think listening is that I might write something down on a list that I already did just so I could cross it off. So it's slightly crazy. But you, you also talk about um, uh, Mark Anderson's use of the anti to-do list, which again, I found intriguing. And the uh, white rabbit statement um, in the Disney movie, or uh, Disney version of Alice in Wonderland, which is don't just do something, stand there, which yes. sort of seems the opposite of the, the Nike um, rule of, or school of just do it. So tell us a little bit about what, what, what are some of the downshifting sure. um, elements? Let me start by just saying where this notion of downshifting comes from. So. Mm -hmm. A, it's not something I invented or heard in the interviews. And also I should mention that it's not mindfulness meditation either. Mm -hmm. uh, I was surprised actually at how few of the people I interviewed did mindfulness meditation. Most of them liked it and tried it. They said they didn't have much time for it. The origin of this approach uh, that I call downshifting really for centuries, it was called contemplation. Oh. And it goes back, the, the templa is like the Roman temple where a priest would go to sort of interpret mm -hmm. signals or messages from the gods. So it's a matter of, as one interviewee put it, kind of getting this notion of productivity out of your head, this notion of knocking off the next item on the list for just a little while. 
Now, some people said that when they did this, they let their minds just kind of run. Hmm. And they often turned either to things they were feeling that they hadn't really noticed because they were busy, thoughts that had been pushed out of their heads because they were focused on task, 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 or sometimes on things going on around them, people around them. But we, our brains are often sort of like lasers and we focus on this and this and this. This was sort of letting that go. But then other people said, you know, that might be great for some people. It drives me crazy. I can't do that. Uh, I, if I'm gonna let my mind go, it's gotta go somewhere. And, you know, something involving nature was often uh. mentioned which by the way, could be a nice nature scene or video on YouTube. It could also be looking out the window as in if I catch you with your feet up looking out the window. And then celebrate was one that a few people referred to. And uh, it, it came from one guy who you could tell was a really hardworking, driven individual. And he's the one who referred to uh, the Japanese just-in-time okay. continuous improvement system is a great way to run a business. But he also said, it's a terrible way to live. And he said, from time to time, he said, you just need to stop. And if you or your team has done something well, even if it's small, then just stop. He said, you know, like rub the certificate, pat yourself on the back, yeah. say we did a great job. Everybody's going to go back to work because that's what we do. So. Yeah. Don't view the little break as dangerous, but take time occasionally to celebrate. And that's just another way of freeing your mind from task, task, task. Yeah. And it's sort of really experiencing either something going on inside you or going on around you uh, that you may not be paying enough attention to. And see what it is. See if you want to spend some time on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have any purpose beyond that. It's just living for for a couple minutes. Yeah. Okay, that again, uh, the mosaic theme of it doesn't have to be a big exactly. uh, walking the Camino or climbing Kilimanjaro or you know something <laughs> exactly. that is a, a huge yeah. task, but it can be these small, these yeah. small bits of activity. So then the- But, but the, let me add something oh, to that, yeah. Deborah. Mm -hmm. sure. And this is really important because we've got these challenges, you know, the internet, productivity, serious responsibilities. What I, people found their own pattern of these sort of small mosaic activities. And the advice in the book mm -hmm. is to observe yourself for a little while oh. and just see at what points in the day or the week just kind of naturally, mm -hmm. you step back from your to-do list. And uh, you can free yourself up a little bit to do one of the three kinds of reflection that I described in the book. And the first is downshifting. But you have to observe yourself, like some of the people in chat who mm -hmm. said, well, I notice I do it when I'm taking a shower, or I do it when I'm at the gym, or I do it when I, somebody said they were playing a particular game or something, playing golf. Yeah. you know. You've got to observe yourself. And by the way, if you find times when you do it naturally and you can build on those and repeat those, then it's not a struggle. It's not an act of virtue and discipline and all that stuff. Yeah. But you've got to observe yourself and see when you do step back a little bit. That's sort of an act of reflection, even in observing yourself. It is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. All right. So from the from the notion of, of downshifting, and I, I get a feel that these four build on each other. Now we're moving yes. into how do we ponder the tough issues? So we're, we're getting some intensification here on strategic decisions and life choices that you start talking about. And you what another thing I love about the book is that you have You've spent, and, and we'll talk about this in a bit, but you have spent an enormous amount of time looking at the literature, not just um, literature on reflection, but broad um, uh, literature of <clears throat> diaries and journaling and yeah. writing and meditating and you know all, all kinds of, of different aspects. And you comment on Proust saying, the true art of discovery wasn't discovering new lands, but seeing things with new eyes. Mm -hmm. So when we have these really tough decisions that we have to make, how, how can you help us think through those? 
let me go back, Deb, and just uh, put something else in front of everyone listening. You triggered this. Uh, I did rely on much more than the interview. So people, there's mm -hmm. a tradition, there's traditions of reflection in the East and the West that go back a long ways. And there's some classics of reflection. So if we come back to this question of good enough reflection, yeah. one of the classics in the Western tradition is the meditations of Marcus Aurelius. Mm -hmm. It's a Roman emperor. He wasn't in Rome enjoying himself. He spent the last 10 years of his life in miserable conditions in Northern Italy, leading soldiers in a war while people were scheming and plotting against him back in Rome. Mm -hmm. And when he had little bits of time, he wrote what was essentially a diary. It's amazing that it survived and we have it. And it, the original title of this was To Himself. And uh, these were just small moments, his own mosaic pattern where he stepped back and reflected a little bit. So these three basic approaches I described really do have deep roots. Mm -hmm. Now this one called pondering is when you've got a big issue but you can use it for small issues. I mean, you know, people used to go to restaurants, some people still do, used to do it without a lot of forethought and planning and masks. Yeah. But if you've got to make any kind of decision, big or small, pondering says, wait a minute, I'm not going to follow my first instinct here. I'm going to spend a few minutes trying to look at it from a variety of different perspectives and see if there's complexities I missed see if there are facets of it that I ought to spend a little more time on, mm -hmm. see if there are things that are actually, once I look at it in a variety of ways, I find a little disturbing and I need to drill down on a little bit more. And what I picked up from the people I interviewed were a variety of ways of doing this. One that uh, sticks with me that I think is really good is, uh, you know, you've got a couple different options. Ponder them by trying to imagine as concretely as you can what it's going to be like for you or you and others to actually implement that option. Mm -hmm. What are you going to be doing? Who's going to be doing it? What's it going to feel like? How are other people going to react? This is triggering your imagination and your feelings to some extent, which may come out of the scenarios you imagine as opposed to just saying, well, I've done cost benefit analysis, this is the winner, let's go ahead with it. Yeah. So it's sort of like a wood carver, you know, turning something over on a lathe and just working on it for a little while. And a little while might be five minutes, 15 minutes. But usually the problems that get to people with serious responsibilities are complicated and they're multifaceted and you gotta try to look at those different facets and do it, and do it purposefully. <clears throat> You also talk about having conversations with yourself, you know, so I, I think again, this, this, yeah. this notion that I'm always intrigued with, if it's me, myself and I in a room, you know, who, who wins yeah. out in the conversation? You know, the, the classic go to the mountain approach tends to be solitary reflection. Mm -hmm. And I would say about a third of the people I interviewed said they reflected really well talking with someone else. And it wasn't just anyone else but at work or in the rest of their lives, um, there was somebody, when they talked with them, there was just sort of a different climate, hmm. a, a, a sense of connection, a sense of trust. And when they had something they wanted to really look at in more depth or sort of ponder, they'd find five or 10 minutes to go down the hallway back when we went down hallways and uh, knock on somebody's door and talk with them about it a little bit. So it was conversational. But three or four people found what really helped was talking with themselves or to themselves. They said they staged back and forth conversations. Um, you know, you probably don't want to do that while you're in public, <laughs> <laughs> you know, walking back from the water cooler right, or whatever. Right. It, could, it could trigger all sorts of stuff, conversations about you. But, uh, you know, if you go back in the Western tradition, the original way of dealing with hard problems was the platonic dialogue. And that was Plato oh, yes. conversing with other people. So conversational reflection is another departure from the classic model 
Yeah. And if, if you just stop and, as I said, observe your life a little bit, and if you find there's a couple of people you can really talk with, mm -hmm. it's a reflective, thoughtful conversation. Go make sure you go to them when you got something, you know, you want to deal with next time. Yeah. Yeah. And then the, the fourth, and I, I know I'm moving very quickly, but I sure, also no want to make sure that we, we get to people's questions because there will be lots of them. The, the fourth layer or the third approach that you talk about is called pause and measure up. And I was thinking as I was reading the book, I, I was wondering if there were either gender or age related, or if there were characteristics that, you know, maybe this group looks at things this way and that group looks at things another way and you know are, are, do we have stereotypical characteristics and then you you uh, open the last chapter with showing how two very different people an older um, white person and then yeah. male and then a younger ethnic person and they both came up with the same questions and they were they were slightly different but they were very similar so um, the one said and I want to make sure I get this right is uh, that they would ask themselves this question, what am I doing that I should stop doing? And what am I doing that I should be doing? And the other person said their approach was to say what I have been doing and what I should be doing. So we had two different age groups, genders, ethnicities, same yeah. kind of approach. These were both managers and they'd been managers for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, and the focus was on doing and that's no surprise. Yeah. There's a way you can take this focus, this third classic approach to reflection, which I call measuring up. And before I describe it, let me just compare it to the other two. The mm -hmm. first one, uh, downshifting, is sort of just being, okay? Mm -hmm. Pondering is kind of a version of thinking. And this last one is about doing. And if you think about being, thinking and doing, it's kind of how we spend all of our time. <laughs> yeah. We may have the mix wrong, whatever, but that's, right. that's, that's what human creatures do. And so this last approach is really, I've got not just to figure something out by pondering, I've got to do A, B, or C, mm -hmm. okay? Right, right. And uh, the idea of measuring up is you certainly want to do whatever the relevant analysis is, cost benefit, get the, you know, run big data, talk to experts and all the rest. But before you make a decision, just step back a little bit and say, are you measuring up in mm -hmm. terms of the broader standards that other people have for you, people you work with, people you report to, larger standards, not just getting the task right, and the standards you have for yourself. So that's what you try to measure up to. And it's measuring without a yardstick, yeah. but it's just saying, wait a minute, longer term, bigger picture, am I meeting these, these standards? Yeah, well, I was thinking about, uh, you know, when you said take a step back, and I think how, again, in, in a very busy and, and complex world, is that like, how far back, and if we're near a cliff, <laughs> we have to be a little yeah. careful about how far back we go. But what, what are you, when you're thinking about that, is taking a step, again, is that a physical? Yeah. Is it a what do you think? Well, here? two things. First, it's a physical step. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, if you probably have to change your, I mean, one person put it very well. He said, you know, you just can't go home and flip a switch and say, I'm going to be reflective for the next hour or so. Somebody also said that if you take the uh, stereotype or caricature of managers in the 50s, these, you know, your white American males running big corporations, they would go home and have a couple of martinis. <laughs> and, <Right. laughs> So that was a way of just maybe changing physically, you know, maybe not as good for you as going to the gym, but it, it changed your psyche a little bit. You got to you got to do yeah. something like yeah. that. The book ends, however, by saying that sometimes you got to step back further. Yeah. And if you've got a big decision, you do have to spend more than just a few minutes on it. Yeah. And um, all of the people virtually interviewed said that they felt they should every couple of weeks, spend not just five minutes here, 10 minutes there, a moment here, but a half an hour or an hour and spend that, you know, being, thinking, doing, either in terms of downshifting, mm -hmm. or are they really measuring up? 
So this classic notion of reflection, go to the mountain, it's been around for a long time. Right. It's got some truth to it. And you can't do everything in sort of a microwave. Sometimes you got to put it in the oven, you know, and let it bake for a while. Right, right. So Joe, um, I want to make sure we get to our participants' questions. So I'll give sure. them just a second to um, start getting your questions into chat that, that we'll take. But let me, while, while people are putting their questions in, let me ask you a little bit about the book. I, I told Joe I was going to ask him, you know, being a librarian, I love books. And so if I think <laughs> about the book as an artifact, one of the things I loved about this book, and I know these are conscious decisions, so I wondered if you would tell us a little bit about it. This is a little book. Yes. It, it fits in my hand. Um, I think when we were first Turn talking about way. this, it goes this way. Like it is, it's small. It fits. It Show the spine. That right. <laughs> All right. So it's not. It's. It reminds me of. I'm. I'm also reading um, the the um, the book on Da Vinci, and it's like you know. I have yeah. to about have a. Um, I don't read it at night because I'll knock myself out if it falls over. But so tell me, tell us about, because I know you did extensive literature review. You did, you had thousands and thousands of pages of, of notes. Right. How did you boil it down to this? Painfully. Yeah. <laughs> and slowly. Yeah, I had about seven or 800 pages of single space notes that I took on yeah. reflection in all its dimensions, uh, classic examples of reflections, Montaigne's essays, the medita meditations of Marcus Aurelius, spiritual exercises of Ignatius Loyola. And I read about those texts as well. And I took notes because I was really interested. And then I had a couple thousand pages of inter transcripts from the interview. Mm -hmm. And the first step was to just to try to organize it and see what sort of fit together and what pattern emerged. But at that point, it was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages but I wanted a book that somebody could sit down, yeah. read easily. I think a couple of years ago, Amazon had a program. I think it was Amazon. You could put in like a couple hundred words of prose, copy paste it in, and it would tell you what educational level that prose was aimed at. Oh, really? And I came out around sophomore in high school. Oh, wow. And I thought that's pretty good. That means people can read what I've written and, okay. and understand it. Yeah. So I really tried to make this uh, short and, and accessible. Uh, folks just don't have time for tomes these days. No, no, it is. It's, it's really tough. But I do, I, we do have a few questions. So All let's, right. uh, let's, let's dive into them. So one person, um, Luca says, thinking reflection mediation. How do you discern amongst these different types of activities? And how, are they, do they all build together into this mosaic or what do you, what do you well, think? Well, you know, if you really want to be systematic and some people were, they would say, look, when I want to reflect, I first of all, spend a little bit of time downshifting just to clear my mind. Mm -hmm. And then if I'm working on a problem and I've got to make a decision, I will sort of ponder it, look at it in different ways. Some people, you know, doodled on blackboards. Uh, some people mm -hmm. doodled on paper. Some people went yeah. and talked to somebody. And then they said, okay, I've got to decide. <clears throat> if I look at it as a technical problem, what am I going to do? And then they put it against this larger standard of measuring up. So you can do it that way. But each one of these approaches to reflection is worth doing in and of itself. I see. Yeah. Uh, they just, you know, they're probably going to make for better decisions and make for better living. So I think in a good week or so, you've spent a little time downshifting and pondering and seeing if you're measuring up. Yeah. Um, another person as says that um, you've talked a lot about different ways to practice reflecting. And are there any practices that you have picked up personally since writing the book? Well, yes. Uh, you mentioned the uh, Marcel Proust. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, he also said, and this is mentioned in the book, don't go too fast. And uh, I interviewed a woman who basically said that she would sometimes take the long way to a meeting and sometimes she'd go to meetings and have arranged meetings in other people's offices rather than having people come right. to her because she wanted to walk there slowly. And this wasn't walk, walking by, you know, managing by walking around. She just wanted to slow down what she was doing. 
And I sort of find sometimes if I, whatever I'm doing, if I do it more slowly, and it's hard to do because yeah. we're in the habit of speeding up, yeah. uh, it, it can lead to thoughts uh, or a sense of what's going on. So that, that's one of the ones I learned from uh, the interviews I did. Yeah, yeah. fascinating. Uh, another person uh, is wondering about, I, I think you touched on this uh, a little bit earlier about somebody who may be running and they start and they answer or they have a couple of questions. So she's, uh, uh, this person is wondering is, do you bring an agenda into the smaller mosaic reflections or are you allowing for an unstructured uh, environment? I think it really can be either way. Either way. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if you really do sort of downshift, you may find there's something that's really bothering you. And then you may want to spend some time pondering that. But yeah. you may not. You just may notice I'm feeling this way and this is how I'm feeling or this is on my mind now. It's been on my mind before. I'll pay, you know, try and keep an eye on it. You don't have to always be doing things. Right. But noticing, noticing them is often important. Yeah, we had another comment earlier about, isn't it wonderful to just stop and take notice that even in mundane things that just, just to um, well, be and you to know, Deb, this can happen at a meeting and it may be especially important if you're running a meeting because you've got an agenda, you're trying to move things along. Some people are helpful, some people aren't, yeah. Yeah. you know, but if you can take 30 seconds in a meeting and just kind of look up from your agenda, where are people coming from? Who's paying attention? That's a little form, brief moment of downshifting can be quite valuable. Yeah, yeah. And then as you are working up the scale um, into pondering, um, we have a question about if when we're in these purposeful, you know, really getting into these, these tougher um, challenges, how do how do we not slide into analysis paralysis? Is is how is there yeah. something that triggers? Okay, I got to move on. And I it, it's probably similar to what you've seen in your writing. Is that you know you can you need to just write instead of getting spending all the time in an an, analyzing the. That's right. Data. Well, uh, that is a risk. Life and work usually take care of the risk because there's just a lot of things you got to do. So the problem is usually not reflecting enough rather than yeah. reflecting too much. Yeah. But if you find you're going around in a pat in a circle, just sort of ruminating, and you don't, you're not making any progress, it's time to move on. Uh, yeah. Maybe come back to it later on, come back to it in another setting, talk to somebody about it. I think it's a circular thing that says enough for now. Right, right. And you had mentioned earlier that in the conversations um, that you had, um, that you didn't find that many of the people you spoke to were um, were practicing mindfulness, where they weren't thinking about that that more slow down and you know just listen to your breathing. And yeah. so there's a question here about the kind of reflection. So the mosaic reflection that you're thinking about. It has some similarities to, um, do you think there are some similarities to meditation? Um, are there techniques and benefits that are similar? Or are well, these I do think very different I, my sense is that there's a variety of ways of practicing mindfulness meditation. And some of them may actually overlap with some of the you know, classic approaches that I described. Mm -hmm. The basic approach to mindfulness though, that has come to the US maybe the US and Europe uh, is basically emptying your mind. Mm -hmm. uh, as you said, by looking at your breath and reflection is typically kind of focusing on something as a beyond your breath, as opposed to just sort of emptying. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'd say they're sort of cousins, but, but different. Right. And what you've been saying all along is there's no one one approach that we could have. Absolutely. That's the notion of the mosaic. I'm thinking of a Chuck Close painting, you know, where all of those mosaics, all those little tiles <laughs> yeah. uh, come together to create a whole. And so that that might be a way, another way and of thinking about let it. Let me mention one other thing, you know, a, a surprise, a lot of the interviews started with somebody coming into my office. These are often people in executive programs at HBS saying, you know, I'd be glad to help out, but I'm not the right person because I really don't reflect. Oh. 
And what they meant by that was they didn't do the go up to the mountain type of reflection. Yeah. And I said, well, I understand. Okay, let's just talk a little bit. And so we would talk for a while. I'd ask them what they thought reflection was. Usually we had another interview scheduled about two weeks later. And in the meantime, I would send them an email, say, did you do anything in the last couple of hours that looked like reflection to try to get a real life slice yeah, of, of yeah. the experience? And it was over that time that they typically found that they actually did reflect in these little bits of time. They just didn't think it was real reflection because real reflection is uh, something else. Yeah. And so if you observe yourself, I think you'll find to some extent you're already doing it. And then the trick is to learn to do it better. And I hope that some of the guidance in the book would be helpful. Yeah. In fact, you talked about, I think it was fairly early on again in the book in um, giving some people some ideas to think about while they were reading the cases, the stories, the, the interview data. And you, you talked about, um, the, I think there were three questions. Is this an obstacle to reflection that I often face? Yes. Is this an approach I should try? And is this something I'm, I'm already doing but could improve? So that almost was, to me, sounded like yeah. how, how to learn to reflect well, better. I actually wanted to call the book a user's manual at one point. Uh, okay. I try to make it the book, reading the book, an opportunity right. for self-reflection. Uh, that was a battle I lost with my editor. May, maybe my editor was right about that. But it is written in many ways as a how to do it book and a user's manual. And self-reflection is definitely part, part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's now th I, I love this question because it's it's not um, just about me. It's about the people I work with or other people in my lives. So the question is, how can I help other people in reflecting? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. Uh, and it would actually make a good research yeah. topic. Uh, and uh, I suspect a lot of it has to do with how you sort of set the tone at the beginning of a meeting. Yeah. And if it's, here's the agenda, one, two, three, or if it's a cursory question, how are you doing? And it's clear you're really not paying attention to the answer and it doesn't matter. And that if somebody answers at any length, they're gonna be getting, if, if, you know, if, that's, if you send that signal, but if you can spend five minutes, how are things going? You know, what's on your mind? That may set a slightly different, uh, tone for the meeting or in the in, in the meeting if you're kind of paying attention and you, you sense some sensitivity about a topic or there's more there than there seems to be there's a way of saying it can we stop on that a minute you seem to have something else in your mind that could take things off in a slightly more reflective reflective vein but as i said this would be a good study and i, yeah. I haven't done it it's an excellent question maybe it's your next step or <laughs> yes. to think yes. about. And I would be remiss because there's been um, a couple of questions here is that you started this research obviously before the pandemic hit. Um, you, now that we are in a totally different work slash life um, environment, um, the, especially considering that so many people are working from home, do you think we will be sacrificing a lot if we continue from work to working from home after the pandemic's question about like how how is this both how is the pandemic um impact or your work now or have would you think differently about some of the would you ask different questions would you um yeah. you'd have different findings and and is this going to change our whole world our way our work world works? yeah well i Sure, a lot of the people listening have their own their own views, which uh, and I'd be interested in hearing some of them. Uh, first of all, it depends on whether your kids are going to school or not. Yeah. <laughs> right. And then a little bit of mosaic yeah. reflection occasionally might be about all you can pull off. And yeah. congratulations if that's if you're pulling it off, yeah. I'd say. Yeah. Uh, other people who are at home feeling kind of isolated, that's uncomfortable. But that might actually open the doors to some sort of reflective moments, okay? Uh, even Zoom fatigue yeah. could actually have an upside because if you're just kind of worn out and we've all had the Zoom experience, maybe that is a time to take a break, look out the window, take a mm -hmm. walk, see what comes to your mind. Uh, 
there's also just so much that's happened in the last year to think about. Yeah. You know, yeah. we've got the rising death toll. Yeah. We've got the, all the disruptions uh, caused by COVID. We've got the pain this is continuing to cause so many, so many people. You know, we've had Black Lives Matter. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot to think about, and some of these things may come pretty close to home. So there's a lot out there. And, uh, you know, if you don't have kids, little kids at home, you know, there may be more time and it may not be so bad. All that said, though, I think my sense is working at home is great with people that you already know because you worked with them in person. Right. But I think it's going to be so hard to start new relationships, yep. start new businesses, you know, do work with new hires yep. if it's just screen to screen. Right, right. There's, I think this is a related question too, is um, many of us face dilemmas that have no good answer. Is there a particular type of reflection that helps you find the right path? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, it's actually kind of what I'm trying to learn about and write about now, mm -hmm. which is the question that, you know, how do you finally decide so you want to talk with people who have experts, you want to look with data, you want to have good discussions with your team, what makes sense. You want those to be honest discussions rather than everybody trying to figure out what the boss wants. Yeah. But sometimes it's still not clear whether you do A, B, or C. Right. And if you're the person who has to decide, um, my basic answer that I'm working with is now is you've got to figure out what's comfortable for you as a person and comfortable for you as a professional, what seems and feels right. And then you just make a decision. Yeah. The way you decide in the end is just by deciding. And you hope you've prepared done enough reflection, analysis, and all the rest. Then you just decide. There's no other algorithm. There's no principle. You just decide. And you hope you get more right than wrong. If you hope if you made a mistake, you can correct it. Yeah. You decide. Yeah. yeah. There's also a stream I'm, or a theme I'm seeing uh, coming into the questions um, about a lot of this has been work oriented, but you also talk a lot about sizing up your own life and understanding what yeah. matters. So can you talk a, a little bit of outside of the, the business context? For sure. How reflection can help us in our, our personal context? Absolutely. And I would start with uh, a great comment from one of the people you referred to, which was, this was the older American guy who emphasized doing just like the younger Asian manager, the female Asian manager. And um, his statement was, you really need to have sort of an architecture for your life. What's the big structure? What are you trying to create? And mm -hmm. you have the right building blocks and pieces in it. And these are the kind of questions where I think you really do have to step back further. Yeah. Uh, if you don't, um, you know, you're just going to be become a creature of your to-do lists and the pressures around you and the things you're trying to avoid. But when you do step back in this and look at these big life issues, I think you still need to clear your mind. And that's kind of a, a way of downshifting that works for you. And if you've got an issue, you've got to try and look at it in a variety of different ways. Yeah. Different from however you happen to be looking at it now, or if you're trapped by you think by how your parents want you to look at it try you know try to escape from that and then think about it in terms of action in terms of doing and, and your standards so these three classic approaches yeah. you, you this is this is reflection okay mm -hmm. so that if you want to reflect find time to do this a little bits of time and occasionally more time this is it this is reflection yeah there, and so related to this is um, someone else asked because you've you've studied and taught about leadership and strategy management, you know, your uh, throughout your career. So the question is, what other adaptive leadership skills or tools complement 
these reflective techniques? Well, I think one is trying to be somewhat disciplined and selective about what you read, either mm -hmm. physical books or what you read online. You know, and you asked what worked and what didn't work for me. Growing up, I loved magazines. There's just so much interesting stuff in magazines. And the internet, as I view, is just this giant endless magazine <laughs> for interesting yeah, right. stuff. Yeah, yeah. But at some point, you got to ask yourself, look back at the last few days or weeks, how much of it do you even remember? Mm. And uh, so I would just say, be a little more careful about upgrading the quality of what you read online and in person. And you can do that, but there's a lot of like candy online and it tastes really good. A lot of really great snack food. Right. You have to think of, think of it in terms of nutrition. Yeah, yeah. Because, yeah. you know, if you want to think me mechanistically, this is the input okay. into your mind. Good and point. I don't mean just into your brain, but you know, into your mind in a deeper sense. So pay attention to it. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Uh, I don't, I'm, I'm just looking here to think about. So the question is, what's next? What are you working on? And what can we look forward to? Well, probably another very short book. And uh, it's really the, what I'm doing now is focusing on this notion of a moral compass. Mm -hmm. And the idea is when you have a tough decision, you can go on Google and you can find a billion references that say, follow your moral compass. Yeah. And I don't think we really have moral compasses in the simple sense that you take it out, it shows you true north and that's what you do. Mm -hmm. That only works with really simple problems. But I think we do have a moral compass, which is a much more complicated mechanism. And it helps us find our way and helps us direct ourselves. And I'm trying to understand that. What, in other words, what our true moral compass is. Well, we'll, we'll wait for that one, but hopefully you'll have the groundbreaking um, revelation in a books at Baker session. How about that? Okay, it's a deal. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> Good, I'll do it. Well, we're almost up on our hour. I can't believe that that time has gone so quickly. So I want to thank you for taking the time to help us think about pausing and reflecting and not just in an esoteric way, but in a very practical, a pragmatic way, giving us steps and, and things to think about so that we can grasp what really matters most to us. You you note in the last chapter, you. Um, that how important it is stepping back gives us these building blocks in a larger structure. You talk about architecture and you quote the American writer, Annie Dillard, how we spend our day is of course, how we spend our lives. So what I'm hoping that all of our uh, participants today, given that we've spent this last hour thinking about reflecting, that we carry that on into indeed how we spend our days and therefore our lives and that we do find the time, whether they're in little tiny snippets like we saw um, coming in the, the chat or that they are in larger spaces that we, we take this time to step back and think about these um, three approaches that are at, at the same time that we aim to um, good enough as opposed to over the bar. So I wanna thank you, Joe, again, for taking the time and I also, as anybody who's been to one of our previous sessions knows that this is a village. Uh, it takes a village to put one of these on. So I also want to thank our co-sponsor, uh, Madeline Meehan who, uh, from HBS Connects, uh, Ashley and Hensley from uh, HBS Marketing Communication because they'll be helping us with the social media aspect. And then there will be a recording. Uh, lots of times people say, when, when can, I, can I share this with somebody? So we will have a recording uh, up in probably usually takes a week to 10 days to get the transcript done, et cetera. Uh, but it'll be there on the Baker Library website. And Nick Wong, who had our, our silent Zoom guru in the background from Media Services has kept us going. And then um, two people from my team who really do all of the work, Dina Gerdeman and Mariah Tumbleson Shaw. They, uh, they make all the magic happen. So I want to leave you uh, with, again, 
Our next book, we're going to take a little bit of a break. I was saying to Joe, we're having a few bandwidth issues um, with lots of changes in staffing and um, priorities at the school, et cetera. So our next session isn't until Jan end of January. Um, so it'll be January 26th, and we'll be looking at Tom DeLong's book, which um, Joe and I were talking a little bit about beforehand. Um, Tom talks about teaching by heart. He's got over 40 years of management and teaching experience. And as he notes, uh, the best teachers are the best leaders and the best leaders are also the best teachers. So he's going to share uh, from his uh, work and, and his life experience, how embracing empathy and authenticity lifts others up and creates very meaningful learning experiences. So again, join me in thanking Joe for um, being here today. Make sure you check out both his faculty page and um, the working knowledge to learn more about it. And um, I wish you all a very, very happy holiday, healthy, healthy season. If I were Angela Crispy here, I'd be telling you to make sure you wash your hands and uh, practice physical distancing uh, because we want to see you all back uh, in January at our next session. And we thank you again, Joe, and hope that everybody has gained um, another practical yet incredibly in, um, impactful approach from your work. So thank you, everybody. We'll see you in January. So long. Thanks again.